Hello there, welcome to History 391. Today I want to talk about the Tet Offensive. Now, we talked about this just before class broke out for the extended spring break, but that was a while ago, and I figured I would go ahead and give kind of a quick recap and talk about it here. So, if you know all this, that's great. Hopefully it's at the very least a refresher. So, where were we? Well, the opening years of the American War in Vietnam really can be seen as a war of attrition. Uh, there's lots of confusion over what the American government is trying to do. Uh, President Johnson has very mixed feelings about it. Certainly the American military wants to see upwards of 400,000 troops on the ground if possible. Johnson doesn't want to do this. President Johnson had lots of reasons for this, uh, particularly driven by his domestic policy. He ends up being the man who signs the Civil Rights Act, among other very important legislation for American culture and society and rights. He also was very, very interested in what he called the Great Society, which was kind of a second New Deal. Johnson had this history as kind of a new New Deal supporter um, and that was really what he wanted to do and Vietnam kind of came in and hijacked a lot of that. Of course his whole presidency was, was really very complex. He'd only become president in the first place because of the assassination of President uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, and so he kind of, although he was had a huge victory in the 1964 presidential election over Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater, um, he kind of has this kind of, you know, complex issue. And of course, the Democratic Party beneath him is changing at the time, in no small part because of his support of the Civil Rights Act. And so he's trying to manage all these kinds of issues. So he's not really interested in Vietnam. At the same time, he has this position that the United States has got into this and now has to do it right. Now, his military advisors are telling him that doing it right involves putting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of American troops into Vietnam. This is not something that Johnson wants to do. And so he ends up having General Westmoreland, who's running the American military, uh, take on this strategy. Westmoreland adopts this idea of the search and destroy missions, where you have American uh, platoons, American units and troops, battalions and so on, who are basically established in South Vietnamese urban centers, going out in the countryside, searching for the guerrilla fighters that are taking them on. And in particular, there's this focus on body count, um, which will come back to kind of haunt the Americans pretty quickly, actually, and something we'll talk about a lot later on in the class. So Westmoreland does not have permission to go into North Vietnam. Uh, the American government is not taking any kind of a position that it's trying to invade North Vietnam or conquer North Vietnam. There is a consistent bombing campaign in North Vietnam called Operation Rolling Thunder, which to the American people is largely presented as something that is kind of a, you know, a defensive posture almost, or if not a defensive posture, certainly a preventative posture. This idea that the, the bombing is only taking place to prevent North Vietnamese aggression. So there's all these kind of halfway house kind of problems that are kind of plaguing the American military effort. Now at the same time, going up into the fall of 1967, you have a consistent kind of stream of supportive language coming out of the American government and coming from Westmoreland himself, who returns to the United States in the fall of 67 to give a series of tours and talks talking about just how well everything is going. And we discussed this in class before the break. Westmoreland really focuses on this idea of um, you know, this, the, the cost of war and the American government is effectively leveraging uh, its superiority in war material and money and everything else to drive the North Vietnamese more or less into bankruptcy. And one of the reasons he's pushing this is not just because it kind of enhances the American advantages in the military conflict, but it comes across as, you know, the American people are willing to make economic kind of sacrifices if it even comes to that. Not that anyone's necessarily seeing it as that, but seeing people die, seeing Americans die is a very, very, very different thing. Now, while all this is happening, Hanoi, the capital of North Vietnam, they're fairly ambivalent as well, um, although they are largely being kind of pushed by Le Duan, this very, very important communist leader in the South, to embrace and to support Southern fighters. As the 1960s goes on, Hanoi's policy starts to shift and they are talked into, or rather maybe they talk themselves into, launching a major offensive on the 30th of January on 1968, what we now know as the Tet Offensive, named after the Lunar New Year celebrations in Vietnam which are called Tet. So even before it happens, now with the benefit of hindsight 2020, we can see this is going to be a major inflection point. A lot of the American case for the war is that every time the North Vietnamese meet us in a straight fight, we beat them, which makes sense. The Americans have better troops, or rather have better well-supplied troops, I should say, have a larger war machine and everything else, have a major technological advantage. At the same time, uh, the guerrilla warfare, which is working so well for the Vietnamese in the South, isn't getting them any kind of immediate concrete results. And Hanoi has complex feelings about how long this is going to go on for and what they're trying to do and everything else. So the idea behind the Tet Offensive from the North Vietnamese perspective was that it could spark a kind of an urban revolution and could see um, an uprising in South Vietnamese cities that would equal what they were seeing as support in the countryside that would be anti-American to be sure, but before that be anti-South Vietnam, anti-RVN, which of course 
course, according to the Vietnamese communists, is a completely illegitimate regime. Claims which are kind of helped by things like, you know, rigged elections and um, Buddhist monks committing suicide and protests and all the other terrible things that have been happening in South Vietnam. Not to mention kind of South Vietnam's identity, particularly the city of Saigon, as a place full of American troops drinking Coca-Cola and having beers and barbecues and just having a great time in between their search and destroy missions. So there's kind of a lot to unpack there and we're going to get to that as kind of the course goes on. So the Tet Offensive happens immediately it seems to be, as in in the first few hours, it seems to be a success for the North Vietnamese, particularly in the city of Hue, where some of the fighting is very, very tough indeed. Um, there's kind of a couple of early moral victories. But by the time the dust is cleared a couple of days later, it's very clear that the Tet Offensive was an absolute disaster, militarily at least, for the North Vietnamese. They had lost a huge amount of troops compared to American and RVN losses. In fact, surprisingly, the army of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese army, had actually been kind of impressive which was the first time in a long time anybody felt they could credibly say that. Militarily, the Tet Offensive was a disaster. Yes, it works out very well for the North Vietnamese. Or perhaps we should more accurately say it works out badly for the Americans. By March, President Lyndon Baines Johnson goes out to the American people and announces that he will not be running for re-election as president. He's effectively stepped down. He, Vietnam has beaten him and he's more or less accepted this. Walter Cronkite, the most famous newsman in America, goes on television and tells the American people that, you know, quote, we did the best we could effectively accepting that the Americans have lost in Vietnam. This is in early 1968 that all this is happening. And the Tet Offensive is this massive inflection point and any kind of heart in the fight that the American government had at least uh, in Vietnam goes out of them after the Tet Offensive. Discussion question for the Tet Offensive. It's kind of a, you know, two things tied to each other. Why do the North Vietnamese and the Americans react so differently to the Tet Offensive? How could such a clear defeat become a win? And how could such what seems like a clear win become a defeat? That's your discussion question, and it's an option for response papers for this week. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.